Infrastructure is destroyed by hostilities, but it keeps on to be destroyed because of shutdowns of electricity, because just of time, because of the impossibility to do the testing and service of necessary proper service and maintenance of this equipment. So basically, the access to necessary equipment in any sphere is very low. Mm -hmm. And now we are speaking about the impact of sanctions. Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. Sanctions are the favorite tool of Western regimes to punish governments of which they disapprove. But it's now not even controversial to suggest that they're tools of collective punishment that cause mass suffering and do nothing to change the policies of targeted governments, let alone those governments themselves. Sometimes it seems as if the suffering is in fact the goal, even though Western officials personalize governments and talk about Assad's Syria, Putin's Russia, Maduro's Venezuela, to obfuscate the fact that these are complex bureaucracies and millions of civilians. Syria has been reduced to two opposing parties, Assad and his henchmen versus the Syrian people. Thus, people might forget that most Syrians live in so-called regime-held areas, meaning Syria, as opposed to insurgent or Turkish or American-occupied areas. To discuss the sanctions on Syria, I'm joined by UN Special Rapporteur, Professor Elena Dohan. She just returned from a 12-day visit to Syria, where she assessed the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures across the country. Upon her return, she called for the sanctions, which she deems illegal and a violation of human rights, to be lifted immediately. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Elena, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure for me. Thank you so much for joining me after this very important report that you released, uh, along with important statements after your, your visit to Syria. And, you know, there's so much in your report uh, that's worth highlighting. Um, but as far as numbers go, I mean, one thing that stood out to me was the fact that you mentioned 90% of people now live below the poverty line in Syria. And that since 2019, prices have increased more than 800%. Hundreds of thousands of jobs have been lost uh, due to the destruction of industries, loss of external trade. And of course, 2019 is when the Caesar sanctions went into effect. So I guess a good place to start is, you know, your report elaborates upon comprehensive sanctions that seem to leave nothing but the air in Syria untouched. Can you describe the various sanctions imposed on Syria? Well, indeed. Um, first of all, it's necessary to say that the word comprehensive is a little bit wrong to be used in this situation. We need to say, speak that uh, there is a number of various types of sanctions being imposed over Syria. We are speaking about the financial sanction that basically means that the Central Bank of Syria, as well as all public banks plus two main private banks, are designated by the U.S., European Union, and a number of other states. So basically no transaction for these banks are possible. Those private banks which are not designated, they have never been engaged into interstate trade. So they basically were just internal, so they do not help much to transfer money to Syria or outside of Syria. Similar situation comes to designation of all high state officials. So basically, as soon as any person becomes appointed as a minister, he becomes designated immediately, just by ex officio, without any accusation of him committing anything wrong. And as a result, these sanctions, which are formally targeted towards individual, end up in targeting the whole industry, the whole sphere, these ministers are responsible for. So basically, if the Minister of Health is targeted, the whole sphere of public hospitals and public health system is targeted as well. Similarly, it works for any other area of business. In the same way, any industrial activity is also targeted. So basically, everything what has anything to do with oil or gas, anything what has to do with any mining, uh, transportation, air transportation, as well as any other sort of industrial activity becomes targeted. And at the very end, there is a number of other institutions which are targeted directly, both public and private. And uh, as a result, it ends 
ends up in a similar comprehension, but comprehensive sanctions as such are not imposed. And another important element here is the issue of overcompliance. Even in situation when something is not targeted, so formally the health industry is not targeted, but nevertheless, in the existence of uh, many sanctions documents, which provides for the possibility to uh, impose secondary sanctions, so to start criminal or civil cases against individuals who try to circumvent the primary sanctions regimes or being engaged into rebuilding of Syria, everyone is scared. So I speak about banks, I speak about any industries, I speak about the companies which produce medical equipment, uh, insurance companies, transportation companies, and the very end, the country becomes totally isolated. You know, it's it's hard, I think, for a lot of people um, out living in normal non-sanctioned countries to comprehend uh, especially when you live in a well-functioning state, just how destructive for a society sanctions can be. So can you elaborate on what has been the impact on the economy as well on as as, as well as on people's lives? I mean, you must have seen so much on your 12-day visit. Indeed. During the country visit to Syria, is basically in any country visit, we do our best to meet all interlocutors. In the situation of Syria, beside the governmental part of the visit, so meeting the ministries and meeting the public hospitals, public schools, for example, we met a number of civil society actors, uh, starting from uh, businesses, pharmaceutical companies, both public and private, I NGOs, uh, national NGOs, UN institutions, diplomats, uh, church, religious organizations, so and even people on the streets. So we had cases when people were just coming and talking about the effect. Uh, so my purpose was to verify what exactly is the impact of sanctions. And I need to say that is different from my other country visits. And the uh, country visit to Syria is the fifth one for me. I visited before Qatar, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and Iran. That the first time when I tried to assess the impact of sanctions over the country, infrastructure of which has already been destroyed or very much affected by military hostilities mm -hmm. on the territory of the country. And moreover, uh, that's a visit to the country which via the government is not currently controlling the whole territory of the country. So basically the territories uh, with oil and gas production, as well as a part of territory which used to be used for agriculture is not under the control of the government any longer, at least for the current moment. And as a result, my purpose was to assess the impact of sanctions. However, keeping in mind that a huge part of infrastructure has been destroyed by military hostilities. Mm -hmm. And we were visiting some uh, cities, some sites where the buildings were totally destroyed and people are living in these buildings. We were visiting, for example, an uh, uh, on-call um, uh, hospital in rural Damascus. And uh, the head of the hospital was showing the traces of uh, bullets, the traces of uh, uh, martyrs being shot to the hospital. And they are saying that we face enormous problems because here was the martyr, it destroyed a half of the wall and killed several technicians and a few doctors and a few patients. Similar situation was, for example, in homes when the main ho hospital is not function because it's just destroyed. So they are using the building of clinic to provide some medical assistance. So this part shall definitely be taken into account because this destruction is not because of sanction, that's because of the hostilities. Similarly, I need to take into account that due to the fact that the government is not controlling the part of the territory which contains 91% of oil production of the country, definitely its revenue from oil shrink enormously. Similar situation as far as the government is not controlling a part of the territory which used to be used for agricultural production, the wheat production is reduced enormously as well. So in a view of existence of these elements, I was assessing the impact of unilateral sanctions on life of people. And what's happened? In the country, infrastructure of which is enormously destroyed. So to give a few very clear examples, in the majority, uh, major part of the country, people have electricity either two hours per day or four hours per day. 
So basically one hour per day, one hour per night. Wow. And it comes to everything what functions in bigger cities, like for example, in Damascus, they have electricity four hours per day. Take into account that hospitals, for example, are state supported entities necessary for the survival of people. They are prioritized in getting access to electricity and they have electricity 10 to 11 hours per day. But for hospitals, it's naturally wow. not sufficient because you have people in intensive care. You need to do surgeries and to people who are needing surgery, they are not waiting for having the electricity. And plus a number of medicine and vaccines are supposed to be kept under standard temperature usually quite a low temperature. So if you do not have a proper temperature, uh, it means that they all are spoiled. So at the very end, there is a sort of program which is supported by the UN agencies to provide hospitals with small generators to be able to keep electricity at least for a part of the building. But it's not; it doesn't work for all the hospitals. And in many cases, it doesn't help. For example, we have been reported that due to permanent shutdowns and uh, switching on of uh, electricity, uh, lots of machinery, including the medical machinery, just broke because of these jumps of electricity supply. Take into account that water supply depends on electricity access a lot. Most of people in Syria do not have electric uh, uh, water. And I'm not speaking about running water. I'm speaking about any sort of drinking water, sewage, and water for irrigation. So when we speak about the drinking water, for cities, there is uh, the infrastructure is quite often destroyed. And in order to pump water, you need electricity. And if you have electricity only one hour per day and one hour per night, it's not enough to pump water. So basically, under the information which I have received, many people get a few hours of water every second day or every fourth day. And that means that the quality of water is not high. For the remote areas, a state tries to send a water tracks uh, to use drinking water, but unfortunately there is a problem with fuel for these tracks and becomes enormously expensive. And in the country with enormous number of internally displaced persons and a huge destruction of the uh, shelter, it's a huge problem. That's why now they have a huge cholera outbreak around the, uh, along the country. I was visiting, for example, hospital in rural area of Homs. So I will just describe, not the hospital, the school. I will describe the school. It's a building which uh, have been reconstructed without any windows. So there are just holes in the wall. Uh, very windy very cold, very old textbooks. Um, not every student have them naturally. Uh, children may have backpacks donated by someone because it's expensive to have a backpack. They are sitting sometimes five, six students on the same desk trying to call listen. And it's not winter yet. It will be very cold in winter. There will be no possibility to heat the place Plus, there is no water. That means that they can't even go to the toilet. They need to wait until the end of lessons to go home, and hopefully they have water there. And uh, similar situation exists in industry because the whole industrial circle is broken. Similar situation exists in the sphere of pharmaceuticals. Syria used to have a very developed system of pharmaceuticals, but they, first of all, they are very much dependent on import of some sorts of raw materials, and they can't do it in the same style they used to do. And plus, they are very much dependent on the equipment. And similar, um, the equipment in the hospitals and equipment in the uh, for production of medicine, uh, with the course of the time, starts to break, and they, they are not able to import this equipment. So what I could observe, infrastructure is destroyed by hostilities, but it keeps on to be destroyed because of shutdowns of electricity, because just of time, because of the impossibility to do the testing and service of necessary proper service and maintenance of this equipment. So basically the access to necessary equipment in any sphere is very low. Mm -hmm. And now we are speaking about the impact of sanctions, import of anything 
what uh, can be used to maintain and restore any of these systems is prohibited. <laughs> so even for the simplest delivery of medicine, which sometimes takes place let's say quite often takes place via UN agencies and I NGOs, they need to get licenses from the US or the European Union for the delivery. And even with these licenses, many companies say, no, we won't sell you medical equipment, we won't sell you medicine if it's for Syria. Many donors say, no, we won't give you any money to deliver anything for Syria. But economically, if all spheres of industry are under sanctions that basically mean that people lose their jobs. And for example, I talk to many people and I talk, for example, to many women which try to get some sort of profession right now. And some of them are not extremely young. And my main question was, why are you getting it now? Did you work before? And they said that, no, before 2010, uh, my husband didn't want me to work. His salary was enough to cover all our expenses and now we are surviving. And unfortunately, um, the economic situation is terrible, especially in the public sector. Uh, there is a reported shortage of qualified staff in all areas, starting from hospitals. Many doctors are enormously young. They are like interns because mm. the higher qualified professionals, some of them migrated. So you have people who are already retiring are extreme or are extremely young. With the shortage of medicine equipment, there are some stories like uh, people have to ask other people, bring them catheters, so regular catheters, to have blood infusion or chemotherapy from abroad because it's not possible to buy it in the country. They are not available, not because uh, they are destroyed, but because they can't be produced in the absence of raw materials. So at the very end, it appeared that in the public sector, the average salary is around $40. Mm. And uh, the poorest food basket costs around $85, $90 for the family. Wow. That basically means that uh, in accordance with FAO statistics, that's official UN statistics, more than 50% of population in Syria are food insecure and two and a half peop uh, million people in Syria are severely food insecure. So I will just explain severely food insecure. That means that people miss days in taking wow. meals. Having been moderate food insecure means that there is a reduction of the number of meals per day and reduction of calories per person. So basically 51% of population misses meals and doesn't eat proteins mostly. For two and a half million of people, they miss days as concerns food. So the situation is desperate. And unfortunately, again, when we come uh, uh, to the element and the impact of sanctions in financial sector, bank transfers to and from Syria are impossible. And many families are citing, for example, the challenges to get remittances from their family members from abroad because they just can't go through the banking sector. And I'm not speaking about huge amounts of money. I speak, for example, about getting a remittance of $100. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, as you mentioned in the report, uh, the banking collapse in Lebanon has made that even more difficult because so many Syrians were reliant on the banking industry in Lebanon, which is no longer functioning. I'm curious, though, you know, throughout all of this, how has, because I know that the Syrian state is still trying to address some of these things, but the state has been dramatically weakened. So can you explain how has the state been weakened and why is that so important in the deterioration of the country? Well, I need to say what I was doing during the country visit. When I'm doing a country visit, the behavior of a state uh, which is under sanctions is very important for me because, for example, when you check in many media, the information is that uh, it's not sanctions. That's because of corruption and mismanagement inside of the country. And, for example, I recently checked my Twitter. It said that the government spends uh, money of people for wrong purposes. <laughs> and that was one of the questions 
which I was asking to all my interlocutors, do you observe any assistance from this side of the government or do you observe, for example, that there are attempts to manipulate this money in one way or another? And I need to say, for example, that not a single interlocutor, I'm, and I mean, I'm not speaking about the governmental one, I speak about non-governmental one, said no, there were attempts to steal our money or to forward it in the wrong direction. So that's the information which I received. Mm -hmm. And uh, many interlocutors, including I NGOs and including uh, many uh, national NGOs as well as church, say that the government is very open and cooperating in trying to distribute this assistance because the situation, humanitarian situation in Syria is really desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, as concerned the, let's say, steps which can be taken by the government, I have seen the budget distribution. And uh, I believe it's always a very important issue how the budget of a state is used. And I could see a real increase of money which are forwarded for social support, for health care, and I speak about percentage. I'm not speaking about the absolute figures. I'm speaking about the share of the budget forwarded for health issues, for food issues, and for social support. Mm -hmm. Also, in reality, take into account that the budget itself is decreasing, yeah. so this increase of share doesn't help much. Mm. especially in a view of enormous inflation. And that's, for example, there are attempts to restructure the subsidies which are provided by the government mm -hmm. to address the poorest one. For example, I have been report about the existence of so-called virtual cards for 4 million households in Syria, which enable owners of the card to get some subsidies, for example, for bread, for sugar, and for some other elements, for gasoline, uh, but for very limited quantities of these at the lower price. Uh, I will give you an example about bread. For example, the uh, one kilo of bread, the cost to produce one kilo of bread is around, um, I would say, half a dollar. So 200, uh, 2,700 Syrian pounds. However, they sell it to those who are in need, it at the cost of 200 Syrian pounds. So 200 Syrian pounds is less than 0 0.5 cent. Wow. So basically they sell it 14 times lower the cost of production. Right. Just to support people because uh, the food situation and food security is terrible. Similar situation exists as concerns sugar and as concerns a few other goods. However, unfortunately, the shortage of many goods as well as the shortage of finances is enormous today and therefore the subsidies are not sufficient. I will give you an example. The government this year is providing to every family 50 liters of uh, fuel for heating. Mm -hmm. uh, I will just explain, we are not speaking about centralized heating. We are speaking about very tiny, like tube, uh, warring stuff where you put a little bit of fuel, so of diesel fuel, and you switch the fire and it heats the whole family. So 50 liters per year can be bought at subsidized price. When I ask people for how long, you can use these 50 liters for how long is it sufficient for you to use it in winter the most positive response was for two weeks wow and they have the possibility to buy it at subsidized price only once per year mm -hmm. if you buy it afterwards you buy it at the black market and you buy it much more expensive and many people have reported that they can't even effort to buy these 50 liters they sell their share to someone who can pay more expensive so that they buy food for themselves. Similar situation exists as concerns the gas for cooking. That's why many people are just cutting trees. So if you just ride on the car, you see that many trees around are cut off and people start to cook at the open fire with wood. It becomes really dangerous. 
quite often they're using dangerous methodology. And for example, we were visiting uh, people, just regular people, I'm not speaking about institutions in homes in Damascus, and they were saying that uh, there are multiple reports about their neighbors dying because of the use of these dangerous means of heating and dangerous means of cooking. So some uh, women were telling us stories about the invention of something with paper to cook to get a little bit of heat. So in reality, uh, the government tries to share and to support with some resources, but it's still a huge problem. What mm. is states, for example, free of charge is education is still free of charge. However, it's problem and even the textbooks are given without any payment. However, it's still very problematic uh, even to, for people even to buy pens and pencils. Moreover, unfortunately, and here I speak about the direct impact of sanctions, the majority of web pages outside of Syria are not available to be accessed. Uh, yeah. And this takes place because of blocking of the international platforms. And unfortunately, there were reports about blocking not only the platforms for payment, like, for example, PayPal, or there is a number of uh, online financial uh, platforms where um, people are collecting donations for humanitarian work. I'm speaking about the regular academic platforms and even we received report that some web pages of the United Nations specialized agencies can't be open from Syria. That's because great. the platform, wow. uh, platform writes that you come from the district, uh, from the region under risk. We do not allow you to proceed. And uh, they can't register in Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, with Syrian IP address or Syrian phone. So many of them try to use VPN, but VPN yeah. is not always stable and they become blocked if it's identified that they are from the risk region. So that's why, for example, Syrians are not active in Twitter or anywhere else. And uh, therefore, there are some subsidies for schools for heating, but still they are not sufficient. So I have figures uh, as concerned the amount of heat and fuel, but I will reflect it in the final report. So the report, what you have seen is a preliminary report. So okay. the final report will be presented. It will be longer with more details, will be presented to the Human Rights Council in September 2023. So I'm still accepting any additional information, what comes. So uh, similar situation, the sphere of health care, Healthcare in the public institution is still free of charge, but unfortunately, they face a shortage of medical doctors. Mm -hmm. I will give you one, the most shocking for me example. We have been reported that for serious surgeries, there are only two anesthesiologists for the whole country. What? Two That's... anesthesiologists for serious surgeries for public institutions. And many people, due to the economic challenges, many people are not able to use the private sector any longer. That's why the, the um, burden over the public institutions is growing. Many of them are destroyed. There are problems to get um, uh, to the place because the there is no possibility to buy buses. The railway infrastructure is 80% destroyed. So you can't use railway. Uh, tickets are very expensive. Buses are in the terrible situation, but people pack there enormously. So it's expensive to get to the hospital. It's expensive. Uh, some medicine are not available. Um, for serious diseases, like, for example, cancer, all treatment was free of charge and including people we are getting the medicine free of charge. Now cancer is the main danger. Uh, danger in Syria because the majority of equipment is not functioning any longer. And it's not possible to procure and to deliver this equipment due to the impact, either the impact of sanctions or overcompliance. You know, I want to hit, I, I actually just, I, I want to let you know, the reason my electricity went off is because I'm in Lebanon, <laughs> which is right next to Syria. So Lebanon's obviously experiencing blackouts too, but it's like the opposite of what you're talking about, where there actually is no functioning state to even help in any of these situations but anyways uh it's a situation it's a problem the whole region it seems like is dealing with right now but 
I wanted to ask you about the issue of overcompliance or what I've heard um, people who work inside sanctions countries called the chill effect that makes so many companies, institutions afraid of dealing with a country that's under sanctions. Can you elaborate a bit on that chill effect? Sure. Unfortunately, one of the most serious challenges of unilateral sanctions is the mechanism of de-risking overcompliance or chill effect, whatever you, or de-risking effect, whatever you call it. Uh, the problem is becoming so overall that it even affects countries which impose sanctions. And uh, for example, my report to the Human Rights Council this year was focusing on overcompliance, but the problem is so broad that I will continue working on that for the next year. So basically the mechanism of overcompliance is very weak. Mm. The situation is the following. So people uh, are deciding not to engage with countries under sanctions or nationals or institutions which they believe may be relevant somehow to the countries under sanctions because of the fear to face negative consequences. It happens because sanctions legislation is very multi-level, very multiple and very unclear. So basically it's very complicated to identify to anyone what exactly the scope of sanctions is. And who is under sanction, who is not under sanction? Point number two is an extremely broad interpretation of sanctions by sanctioning countries. I will give you an example. I had a, a very intensive discussion with several NGOs, both NGOs and national NGOs in Syria. And we were discussing the possibility to provide some courses for teachers at schools and some courses for people who try to handle water pump in one way or another. And the interpretation of the European Union of sanctions imposed was that these people can't be provided with any sort of training or any sort of support because they get their salaries from the budget. So everyone who is paid from the budget, like teachers at the school, uni professor, university professors, people covering the functioning of water pumps, electricity, railway, buses, if it's public buses, they get a salary from the state budget. They can't be trained. They can't be assisted. And even, for example, if a state said that uh, we want to help to provide social care to someone, we will give you a building to provide some training for, to, you, you give the building to NGO to provide some training, it's not possible to get any donations or any assistance because the building is state owned. There were absurd reports uh, when, for example, people were, were obliged to check even who are the owners of the hotel they plan to stay for a night and if it's at least partially a public person or a public entity, they couldn't do it. So they are requested to exercise this level of diligence because of this broad interpretation. Plus there is a policy to impose uh, uh, civil suits, so impose fines. And take into account that these fines are enormous. I'm not speaking about Syria now, now because the most ridiculous example is an example of Paribas Bank, which was working with Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And this bank has been fined to $9 billion. What? For the $9 billion. Oh, my God. For circumvention of sanction, U.S. sanctions regimes towards Venezuela. There is a number of banks who have been fined like $3 billion. But anyway, for any bank, it's a bankruptcy. Right. There, moreover, the regulation for imposition of some sanctions say that uh, entity can be subjected uh, to sanctions, to secondary sanctions, if it circumvents somehow the sanctions regime or is getting money from the state under sanctions. And that basically means in a broad understanding of a state and a broad understanding of public matter, even for medical equipment production company to get money from the Ministry of Health of the country under sanctions means a huge risk because yeah. formally it's getting money from the government of a country under sanctions. Mm -hmm. And therefore they prefer not to risk. 
naturally there is a mechanism to get derogation exceptions or exemptions. But these mechanisms are usually very costly. Uh, I was informed that you as, as an NGO, for example, you are supposed either to have a huge team of lawyers or you need to pay a lot. One of NGOs said that uh, gave me an amazing example. They managed to get donations of $20,000 and they were willing to deliver humanitarian aid to Syria. But when they tried to find out how to get a derogation for these $20,000, they were informed that they are supposed to pay lawyers $20,000 for this derogation. But they do not have any other money. They have only $20,000. So they decided to quit and not to provide this money. Oh. So smaller, because if they spend $20,000, they have nothing to transfer to Syria. Mm -hmm. So at the very end, uh, due to all these and other NGOs has informed me that they were supposed to do a project in Syria. However, take into account that they were supposed to, um, to communicate to one of public institutions for delivery of humanitarian aid. They were requested to get not one, but three various derogations. One, to buy uh, fuel for the car, because fuel is sold by the public company. So to fuel your car, you need one derogation. To deliver medicine to the public institution, you need another derogation. So it means that the process is so complicated that no one knows what to do. And right. everyone is, moreover, quite often, many institutions came at the stage when they said that if you work, for example, with Syria, with Venezuela or Iran, you will lose our market. Or mm -hmm. bank, you will lose all correspondent banks for the U.S. or the European Union. So comparatively to U.S. and European market, market of Syria or market of Iran is a smaller one. Right. So all countries prefer not to risk uh, and be, all businesses prefer not to risk. Formally, from the legal point of view, there, is, there are guiding principles on business and human rights. And these guiding principles on business and human rights developed and adopted within the United Nations request businesses to behave in the way that their activity doesn't violate human rights. And they also request that states on the territory of which businesses are placed or under jurisdiction of which businesses are placed, make sure that the business activity on their territory or under their jurisdiction doesn't violate human rights. And I discussed this issue with many countries which impose sanctions. And we come to a circle. The country which imposes sanctions say we have wonderful humanitarian exceptions. And we do not impose sanctions here. The, for example, the European Union states say that businesses are scared of the US sanctions, not of our sanctions. Mm -hmm. We told them not to follow sanctions of the US. But when I talk to businesses, businesses say, you know, but we are not protected by our state. We have to make sure that we continue our business activity and we do not go bankrupt because, for example, the European Union blockage statute is not helpful. Mm -hmm. Similar, the risk and policy is observed by donors because donors now want to know what will be the project. When, for example, when we speak about Syria, donors quite often are ready to provide money to deliver medicine. But as soon as it comes, for example, to deliver a generator to support water pump, they say no, because it's considered to be a development reconstruction project. And they are only ready for humanitarian projects. And no one cares that people die because of cholera, because having no access to drinking water, and they die before, be, be, without food, because irrigation system is non-existent. Similar situation exists in the sphere of electricity. There is one huge electricity uh, producing plant in Syria, which provides... 40% of electricity now. So now they face terrible challenges with electricity and one plant produces 40%. This plant has not been maintained properly for 12 years. Mm. That means it may stop any second. Companies provide, producing equipment and spare parts as well as maintenance for this equipment are European companies and they both said, no, we are scared of sanctions. Maintaining this electricity plant is reconstruction, and we won't engage at all. 
I talked to a number of NGOs, they're complaining about these facts enormously. And therefore, NGOs also prefer not to risk because they are scared. Many of them had their bank accounts blocked mm -hmm. because of working, for example, with Syria, with Iran, or with Venezuela. They also try to overcomply. And unfortunately, I can say that overcompliance is affecting human rights not less than sanctions as such, quite often even higher. Wow. You know, that brings us to the question of, are these sanctions even legal? I mean, these are unilateral sanctions coming not from the international community, but from specific countries. And you've actually argued that they're not legal. So can you explain your reasoning for that? Yes, indeed. I, as an international law professor, I try to stuck to international law at, uh, a lot. So from the point of the UN Charter, the only entity entitled to impose sanctions is the UN Security Council. How, and the uh, UN Security Council actively used this method, especially in 1990s and early 2000. Mm -hmm. What's important, however, that beside the legality, the UN Security Council was the institution which introduced the principle of humanity as well. In 2004, there was a methodology developed by OCHA and EASC which assessed the impact of UN Security Council sanctions over Iraq, as well as a few other states being under, I will remind again, absolutely legal sanctions of the UN Security Council. And it appeared that humanitarian impact was so enormous that starting from 2005, the UN Security Council changed its approach towards sanctions and it started to be extremely targeted. Mm -hmm. Plus, UN Security Council is very predictable as concerned the list. The list of sanctions is not changing fast. Moreover, the level of over there are no secondary sanctions by the UN Security Council. And therefore, the level of over compliance with UN Security Council sanctions is enormously low. Quite often, states seek to influence each other by the means of pressure. And it doesn't mean that it's prohibited. So basically, some elements of which are currently called to be sanctions are not illegal. And I will give you examples. Okay. For example, if countries are not happy with the behavior of each other, they may decide to, to reduce the level of diplomatic presence in the country or to stop diplomatic relations. Or they may decide that they were discussing, concluding a cooperation agreement. They may decide that they won't do it. Or they may decide that they will withdraw from the existing agreement. And they also can do it, but it's necessary to keep uh, in mind that it's not possible to withdraw from the international treaty today for today. Under the law of international treaties, there shall be a warning at least 12 months in advance. So if these steps are taken, they are legal from the point of international law. That's how states influence each other. There is also a mechanism of countermeasures, which is also legal. So under the countermeasures, states are entitled to take countermeasures, so to violate international obligations towards another state which has already committed violation of international obligations. Quite often, it's not fulfillment of obligations from the same treaty. In accordance with international law, only directly affected states can use countermeasures. There are a few cases when one speaks about so-called um, peremptory norms of international law, like for example, when we speak about aggression, genocide, crimes against humanity, then every state around the world is entitled to take countermeasures. Countermeasures shall have aim to restore fulfillment of international obligations. It can't aim to punish. It can't aim to put maximum pressure campaign. It can't aim to change the government in the country. The only possible aim to restore fulfillment of international obligations. Moreover, they shall be proportionate to violation happened. They shall be necessary, so no other means are available. And they can't violate peremptory norms of international law, including they can't violate fundamental human rights. So that means that even if state stops to fulfill international obligations towards another state, 
it's obliged to check that it does its activity doesn't violate fundamental human rights was definitely not the case with unilateral sanctions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, on, uh, the majority of things which take place today in the format of unilateral sanctions do not correspond to the criteria of retortion, so unfriendly but legal acts, and they do not correspond to criteria of countermeasures. From the point of international law, any state before taking any unilateral action is obliged to check whether the, any international obligations will be violated. And we are not speaking about the human rights obligations only. There are lots of issues with the law of, uh, with diplomatic law, consular law, because um, many, for example, diplomats in Syria, as well as diplomats of Venezuela, Iran, and many other countries are facing challenges. So the diplomatic mission can't have a bank account open. So they can't receive their salaries in other countries. They can't have a bank account to get money for consular services. They can't serve their own citizens. They can't get insurances even for diplomatic premises and many other elements, which is absolutely against diplomatic law. We speak about trade law. Usually states participate in many trade agreements, protection of investment agreements. So these norms shall be checked. Mm -hmm. I speak about the norms of, for example, judicial immunities of states and state property. In accordance with customary norms of international law, assets of central banks, which are usually frozen as a sort of unilateral sanctions, as well as other public assets, can't be frozen. Never. They enjoy mm -hmm. immunity. Even if there is a civil suit against a country, they enjoy immunity. So this money are used not for the benefit of the government. They are used for the benefit of a state. That's a means, that's a revenue to assist people of the country. So basically, I won't go in details if you, let's say, if you ask, I can give some other example. But there are lots of spheres of international law which shall be checked and which unfortunately are violated by unilateral sanctions. And the second problem is to check the humanitarian impact. There is mm -hmm. a principle of precaution. States are obliged to make sure that the activity under their jurisdiction and control do not affect human rights anywhere around the world. So this element is not observed as well. And then the other aspect of these particular sanctions, um, with the Caesar sanctions, that is, is the secondary sanctions that prevent even neighboring countries from doing any sort of business with Syria uh, out of fear that they'll be sanctioned as well. And I'm curious, is that legal? Like, are secondary sanctions legal? Can countries like Lebanon or Iraq just say, no, I'm not going to follow your sanctions? Um, are they able to do that? That's a very interesting question, Tay, because as concerned this question, even countries which impose sanctions disagree with each other. Yeah. When we speak about the imposition of secondary sanctions to third countries, third country nationals and third country entities, we speak about the use of extraterritorial jurisdiction, what is totally illegal under international law. And even, for example, we speak about the U.S. behavior and European Union behavior. The European Union repeatedly made public statements that European Union doesn't recognize extraterritorial jurisdiction and extraterritorial application of any measures, and we know that they are illegal. So therefore, the use of any extraterritorial activity is illegal under international law. And exactly that the issue how neighboring countries are affected, and by the way, I plan to engage with, start to engage with neighboring countries because I can observe how much they are affected by the impact of sanctions imposed against their neighbors. And one of my plans to do a country visit across several neighboring countries, not being directly subjected to sanctions to assess how human rights of their citizens or people on their territory are affected by these acts. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an, I mean, it's so important because even Lebanon used to get a certain amount of electricity uh, from Syria. Not that Syria is really able to produce that much electricity anymore, but uh, that that actually stopped after the Caesar sanctions because of fear of secondary sanctions. So it's quite an interesting 
phenomenon that leaves countries in much weaker positions. Um, I'm also curious, how did this mission of yours to Damascus in person enable you to understand more things that are not already in the public realm or have been reported or expected in such contexts? Well, as I have said, uh, the country visit to Syria was the first one for me when visiting a country which has been affected enormously by military hostilities. Mm -hmm. However, many elements about the impact of sanctions as well as situation in the country are very much the same um, and very similar to those which I had uh, in other countries in which I did mm -hmm. country visits like Iran or Zimbabwe or Venezuela. Unfortunately, when we start to discuss the impact of unilateral sanctions, for example, in Europe or in the US, what we see in media, what we see in Twitter, we see the discussion about sanctions very politicized yeah. and absolutely in black and white. Hmm. The discussion usually comes, it's only sanctions or not sanctions at all. And when I try to present figures, uh, the first reaction is usually, oh, you say that it's only sanctions. I do not say that it's only sanctions. We have a number of other criteria. My task as a mandate holder is to identify the impact of sanctions. Naturally, keeping in mind that there can be other reasons, military conflict, they can be COVID, they can be earthquake, whatever. Right. So unfortunately, I believe that first of all, we need to start to listen to each other. And... Uh, my usual recommendation is please do not read Twitter, please read the report. Right. <laughs> and sometimes please do not read some sort of short article, please read the reports. Because in any article, in any Twitter, I can't give figures. There are lots of, I try to be very precise. And first of all, we need to start to speak about reality, about figures, facts, and impacts. Mm -hmm. Problem number two, there is no methodology seeking to assess the impact of unilateral sanctions accepted by everyone at the UN level. It happens because of a number of reasons, starting from the point that this mandate is rather new, it has been established only in 2015, and formally, I'm the only institution, one person within the UN who is focusing on this element. Mm -hmm. As I have mentioned, there was a methodology developed by OCHA and EASC for, to, for assessment of impact of sanctions of the UN Security Council. But so far, there is no overall methodology to assess the impact of unilateral sanctions plus over compliance. There are a few tiny academic attempts to do it, but they are really very fragmentary. That's why what I'm currently doing, I believe that, let's say, one person can't assess the impact of sanctions on everywhere, every, around the world. Right. It shall be done centralized by UN country teams and by the NGOs on the ground. And I'm currently working on development of this methodology together with NGOs and together with scholars. We had uh, expert consultation on March. Based on these consultations, I have prepared the draft. We will have the next expert consultations with scholars and NGOs in January. And I hope to be able to finalize the methodology and propose it to the UN to be shared with the UN country teams and with NGOs. It will give us the possibility to assess situation and impact in every country and to verify uh, information coming, for example, from NGOs, from government and from uh, United Nations organs to have the clear understanding what's happening. One of the important elements for me, I'm not checking what exactly is happening now. I'm checking how situation has changed from the moment when sanctions were imposed. Right. Because that's how you can see the difference and you can see the impact. Another problem is overcompliance. So, and people do not understand that overcompliance is something what is very serious. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the issue of legality. What's very unfortunate for me is that when we discuss, uh, when I'm asked, if not sanctions, what else shall be? How states shall behave? Mm -hmm. My only recommendation as a lawyer, states shall behave in accordance with the international obligations plus principle of humanity. 
And that's how the system will function. And that's how we can remove many challenges. You know, I, I just have a couple more questions here and I do appreciate your time. Um, you know, your report wasn't, isn't the first one to call attention to the problem with sanctioning Syria. I'm sure, I'm, as you're aware, um, I, I actually remember back in 2016, I wrote an article for The Intercept about a leaked UN report that called the sanctions regime on Syria the most severe ever imposed. Yet, and that was that was back in 2016. Now we're in 2022. And not only has nothing changed, but the situation has become dramatically worse. Um, so why is it that these sanctions persist despite the documented toll on civilians? I believe that one of the challenges which have faced as concerned the uh, assessment of impact of sanctions and taking action in this sphere is that the level of awareness about the impact is very low. When I was in Syria, I received a number of reports which have been drafted in 2016, which were drafted in 2018. But in reality, when we speak on the outside area, people do not see it and people do not read it. First of all, because the media sphere is very much dominated by the opposite vision. Mm -hmm. Secondly, because reports are long, dramatic, and very uneasy to be understood. So you need to be interested to read the report. And thirdly, one of the issues is uh, people do not know where to look for these reports because what we are currently observing, and it's not about Syria only. In many countries, there are amazing reports about the impact of sanctions done by the UN country teams, but they stay at the level of the country teams. They do not go up to the level of headquarters. Because unfortunately, again, this mandate is very new. The issue mm -hmm. of the impact of unilateral sanctions has not been included yet as a part of agenda of all UN organs. And that's what I try to change right now. I have meetings with various UN organs and say, please, besides 100 other elements you take into account, please include the impact of unilateral sanctions as 100 first, because it's also important. That's how system function. It didn't exist. So we need to change the system aid in this extra element. And that's not easy. It happens gradually because quite often people do not understand how, for example, the work of UNESCO can be affected by unilateral sanctions, but it is. Right. Similar situation. Uh, I have been uh, complained to, uh, to by many NGOs that they publish reports and no one sees them. Mm -hmm. That's why one of the initiatives, basically they pushed me to the initiative, NGOs, as well as scholars. Scholars complain that we publish, for example, in Arabic or Russian or Chinese or even French, and no one sees our reports or publications when it comes to the issue of sanctions. Everyone reads only English. And therefore, I came to the idea that we need to have the open platforms open for focusing on the issue of unilateral sanctions and open for everyone. So basically right now I'm finalizing the project of starting the sanctions research platform, which will be the extension of the UN Human Rights Library. So the intention is to include the all publications about sanctions on all six UN languages, to include the reports of NGOs, to include the reports of all UN organs, because UN is huge. And quite often, one body doesn't know what has been issued by another because it has its own task, and especially what is done by one country team and the country under sanctions. So my idea is to bring this all together and plus to bring the decisions, so judicial decisions in sanctions cases. Many NGOs tell me, can we send you videos because they are very emotional. So basically I said that everything what they are ready to publish or what they have already published will be there. So my idea to encourage the research, to raise awareness and to help NGOs to feel that they are not alone and to help scholars to feel they are not alone because NGOs said, oh, we published a report and we are scared that we will be subjected to secondary sanctions because no one else did it. And I say, no, you are not alone. That's why I build up this cooperation of NGOs so that they can support each other. So hopefully, if everything goes well, I'm supposed to have this platform functioning by the beginning of the next year. 
Wow. That's very ambitious. And I really hope that works out. I think that would be very useful for journalists as well, for people in media to be able to access that sort of information in one place. Um, and I guess, you know, lastly, I just wanted to ask you, you recommended, you, you actually released a statement uh, essentially calling for the immediate lifting of these unilateral course of measures. Can you just very quickly give us an idea of why that is your recommendation? Although after listening to you speak about it, it's it's pretty clear why. But is that is that ultimately what you believe needs to happen? Is that these sanctions need to be lifted like now? Well, I naturally believe that sanctions shall be lifted. But as you see in the recommendations, I'm not only, let's say, legalistic, I'm pretty realistic in many elements. And I understand that it won't happen immediately. That's mm -hmm. why there is a number of recommendations which, uh, let's say, shall have priority in the period before sanctions are lifted. And that's why I request, for example, that sanctions which prevent reconstruction of critical infrastructure shall be the first one to be lifted to keep People of, to let people of Syria to survive the coming winter. Because one of the, I will cite now, a few people, uh, I met, uh, let's say, amazing people. I'm very, not only surprised, I'm astonished by the level of resilience, hard work, and, and hope some of them see. But unfortunately, quite a lot of them were speaking in the same phrase. They have seen many people dying in hostilities, and now they observe how the hope is dying. And that the most scary feeling, and uh, the same feeling and the, the same expression was used by Jan and Alt, by NGOs and uh, church leaders. And that's the part of reality. That's why I naturally understand that lifting of immediate lifting of all sanctions is, let's say, pretty naive idea. But I believe that the step number one shall be finally to start taking into account the humanitarian costs of what's happening and to lift sanctions affecting critical infrastructure, food, health, electricity, water, heating. The basics you need to survive. Um, Dr. Elena Dohan, I want to thank you for joining me and giving me so much of your time and breaking all this down for us. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.